Okay, so the story is called The Legend of the Two uh, Brothers and the Founding of Jerusalem. How many of you have heard of that story before? No one ever heard of it? You've heard of it? Not a coincidence, probably from me. <laughs> okay. The story, I believe, is told to every single Jewish group that visits the Old City and that does a pilgrimage to the Kotel, to the Western Wall, to the Temple Mount. And the story goes that once upon a time there were two brothers. One brother had many children, and the other brother was a bachelor. And the two brothers lived on two different sides of the same, of the same mountain. And they didn't have a very deep connection. They weren't regularly in touch, but they had a concern for one another. And one night, the brother who had numerous children said, geez, my, my, my brother is totally alone. He has nobody to help him harvest, no one to help him you know, work in the field. So I'm going to go and take some of my produce and bring it over to his home and leave it in his storehouse. At the exact same time, the bachelor on the other side of the mountain was thinking about how his brother has so many mouths to feed. I'll take some of my produce that I don't need all of it and I'll bring it over to his warehouse so that he'll have more. So at night, each brother would take over some of their crops, some of their produce, and bring it over to the, uh, to the other brother on the side of the mountain. And in the morning, they would wake up and be shocked that the exact amount that they had was replenished, even though they'd given away some of it. And they didn't understand how that was happening. And night after night, they would unilaterally go and do this amazing act of brotherliness, of kindness, and then wake up and see that they hadn't lost anything. Until the third night, the two brothers, each carrying their produce at the top of the mountain, bump into each other, seeing that the other one was coming towards them. And at that moment, they hug and they embrace, and a heavenly voice comes out and says, this is where my temple shall be built. What are the values that are being represented in this myth? Talk about myth. What are some of the values that the, that the Temple Mount Haram al-Sharif is supposed to therefore be representing? Yes? Um, generosity, <coughs> kindness. Generosity, kindness. What else? Care. Care. What else? Brotherhood. Brotherliness. Yes? We cooperate. Everybody benefits. Okay, so there's a, there's a, there's a tit-for-tat cooperation. <laughs> they didn't do it on purpose, but yes? Caring for people that live differently from you. Caring for people that live differently from you. Let's worry, I'm going to come back to that in a moment. What else? Love. Yes. Love. Love. Yes. Charitable giving. Charitable giving, right? It's not just an emotion of love. It's the act of loving, <laughs> right? Or the art of loving. Yes. I mean, Brotherhood was said, but I just want to like explain the familiar ties. That there was a familiar tie, right? That there was a, that there was a connectedness there. That the mountain represented. Anything else? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I guess sacrifice is a Mm-hmm. A willingness to have a bit of self-sacrifice, right? So you have in this myth, right, all of these great values, human values, religious values that are promoting pro-social behavior, right? Promoting not just, you know, thinking about brotherliness, but actually doing unilateral gestures of kindness, which is one of the great wisdoms that you find both in Judaism and Islam. Right, that promote these type of behaviors of, uh, of helping the other. But here's the question. We've always been talking about the ambiguity or the ambivalence of the sacred, the ambiguity in the text. What is the ambiguity within this story? What is unclear that can be read in very different ways? I'll give you a little hint. Okay? One of the biggest ambiguities of religion in conflict and peace is the scope. Right? The myth doesn't stand as a historical legend. It's, as a historical account, it's a legend to promote pro-social behavior. Between who? Who are the two brothers representing here? I don't have it on me, but if I were to show you, if you were to Google the two brothers of Jerusalem or something like that, you will find children's books that Israelis and Jewish children will read 
okay, where you'll see two young boys, each wearing a, a kippah. That's wonderful. We definitely need Jewish boys that are Orthodox to not fight with each other. Yeah. <laughs> they do, okay? And it's wonderful that the Temple Mount should be a representation of how you should behave. Can we expand, however, who the identity of those two different sides, right? What if one brother was, the bachelor was secular, right? And the brother with many children was religious or ultra-Orthodox or religious Zionist or something of that nature. Could we expand the narrative the way it's told over to be intra-Jewish across political ideological divisions? Could you expand it to be beyond Jewish? To be Jewish Muslim, for example. Now here's the trick, here's the, here, the catch of this story, which is fascinating. I, again, I haven't done any uh, research on this, you know, hard research on this, about what percentage of Jewish groups go to the old city and are told this story. But I want to, uh, again, assume that most hear this story with their tour guide. And the tour guide will often say, the Talmud says, and then they tell the legend. There's only one little problem, is that if you know anything about Jewish text, you need to know where is it written in the Talmud, right? So you go around and you start looking and you do all these database searches, you won't find it <laughs> because it's not in the Talmud. Uh, a Talmud professor about 15, 20 years ago, uh, Eliezer Segel said, I need to figure out where this legend is coming from. So he started researching it. Turns out it's an ancient Palestinian legend that was converted as a narrative to Judaism in the mid-19th century by a traveling rabbi who came and heard it from a Palestinian farmer about Jerusalem and therefore turned it into being an intra-Jewish story, right? Now this, and, and, and he, you can look it up online, it's called a Palestinian Midrash. Pretty easy to Google that. Okay, a Palestinian Midrash, the legend of the two brothers in its original state and how it evolved. But for our purposes of religious peace building, it raises a very interesting possibility. We could go down the path of saying, it's our story of brotherliness, love, and care for the other, not yours. Or, you can see that as an opportunity, can we find space for my identity and narrative, and for the identity and the narrative of the other, the other side of that mountain, within our story. Can we share a story? Here's the thing, the mountain is not real estate, as we've been talking about. The mountain is kadosh. It's holy. Holiness is not just, it's, 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 it's intrinsic for religious believers, but it gets holiness through the stories that are told about it. If we can't share the stories and identify how they're being told over in different ways and figure out a way to be more expansive <laughs> of them, it's really hard to share the mountain. That's why narrative and religious texts and identity play such an incredibly important role in the work of figuring out what do we do with these sacred spaces. We have to know everybody's story on it. So now to your assignment. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll preface with one thing. Wait, I wanted to say one thing. You play a role in this story. And that's why I believe in teaching here. You play a really important role in this story. You might not be one of the brothers, okay, living here as a side of the conflict. But when you have two brothers that are not willing to take that step of unilateral kindness, because they're really afraid of actually meeting in the middle of the night the other and not being hugged and embraced, but actually being hurt and killed or, or, or whatever. You need people that are going to be able to go back and forth, like we studied with Aaron, or we studied with others, that will build that trust and say, I promise you, there's a way that you guys can meet. And that's why I see the role of international students as being narrative translators, cultural translators, right? 
how do you get the two different brothers to understand their narrative, the other narrative, and to begin to want to have curiosity to think about, oh my God, my brother is also having needs and living on this mountain. How are we going to share this sacred space? Hey guys, if you want to see more videos like these, please donate. I accept baked goods, free trips to Bora Bora, anything. <laughs>